Sorry, and uh, thank all of you here. Um, I, I haven't registered to speak for the first day of spring. There's no reason why everybody should be spending two hours inside when uh, the weather is like this outside. Anyway, Dale and I really appreciate the fact that you are. Um, before we came, we tossed the coin. Um, I tossed the coin. I got to present. He gets to answer the question, <laughs> especially if they're difficult ones. So, what I'm going to do today is to give you a very, very brief <coughs> overview of the uh, research that's going on at the hospital. Um, perhaps tell you a little bit about why local funding opportunities and fundraising like this are so important to us. But spend most of the time uh, trying to add a bit of a personal touch to some of the uh, great research that's going on at KGH, at DC, and the Hotel Du. So I'll spend most of the time talking about people and trying to put it in uh, a bit of a research context for you. I'm not promoting these people. <laughs> these are just a sample of the great research that we've got going on at all three, uh, all three hospitals. So uh, please bear that in mind when it's a somewhat eclectic Selection of individuals uh, from DC, KGH, and, uh, and Hotel View. So I, I don't know how many people in the audience have an idea of what the scale of the research is that is taking place at the hospital. And, and so that's the intention of uh, this slide here. And you can see uh, these are last year's numbers. And <clears throat> this year, the total externally funded research taking place at the three uh, hospitals will exceed about $25 million. Uh, um, that's per year, not total committed uh, funding. And there'll be close to 400 active uh, research projects. Um, we have a very active, uh, for the size of the community, clinical trials program. And this excludes cancer clinical trials, which are a whole other story. Um, but the clinical trials generate at the moment about $3.5 to $4 million in industry-sponsored uh, support. Uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you how many patients are actually on the trial because we have financial records which exceed our ability to track people. So we use the dollars as a surrogate indicator of how many people are actually participating in the trial. So there are about 225 open trials and 170 of them actively accruing patients. And you might say, well, why aren't all of them accruing patients? Well, the um, pediatric oncology, virtually every child uh, who is unfortunate enough to develop some type of malignancy is actually invariably put on a clinical trial. So we have about 50 or 60 open clinical trials in pediatric oncology. And the number of clinical trials fortunately, actually exceeds the number of uh, children that we are able to enter into them. But they're kept open so that if a case does present itself, we can immediately enroll that child into a clinical trial. So um, you know, $25 million is quite a lot of money. Um, if we looked at the Faculty of Health Science as a whole, the number would be about $80 million. So the hospitals generate about 25 to 30 percent of the total health research funding uh, across the Queen's academic uh, health sciences uh, campus. Um, but it's becoming more and more difficult to get these dollars. Our biggest funding agency is the Canadian Institute for Health Research. And it's the largest health research funding organization in Canada, has a budget of close to a billion dollars a year. The success rate at CIHR is now, the national success rate, is now 17%. So um, a tremendous amount of work goes into putting grant applications together, and less than one in five are going to get funded. So why is the local uh, funding so important? It's important for the reasons that Margaret alluded to. Uh, she used uh, Dr. Garland as, as, as an example. We're competing with institutions that have very large amounts of local research funding available to them. And what it allows them to do is carry out the pilot studies that Mark referred to that are then used to substantiate the grant applications that go into external uh, agencies. And it's becoming more and more challenging for us to compete in that arena. Uh, it's, I was giving this talk in Ottawa at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, for example, I would be thankful 
banking the local community for five million dollars a year in support that goes into the research institute. And I mention it only because it's the reality of the situation. That's who we're competing with. If I go to Sunnybrook at the research institute, 24 to 25 million dollars a year. We do remarkably well. Our success rate at CIHR over the last three or four years, that's six or seven competitions, has been between 50% and 100% higher than the national average. So I would say, I think we, um, what is it, we punch above our weight to use a pugilistic <laughs> metaphor, um, but it's becoming increasingly hard to do so. So initiatives like this, I think, are at, they're essential, they're incredibly important to us, and uh, we really want to thank you for um, going to the efforts that you clearly, uh, clearly are. So back to the uh, presentation. So with 235 projects to choose from, uh, this is an unreadable map of what research at the three hospitals looks like. And um, I was going to threaten to spend the next two and a half hours walking you through <laughs> uh, <laughs> diagram, but I promised Mark that we'd be done. Uh, bit shorter time than two and a half hours, so on the go. Um, so I'll take some examples of <coughs> where of research where we can see an almost immediate change on the way in which clinical service is uh, delivered, or indeed ways in which health policy has been changed. So just a few examples here. Um, at the top there, um, this was a study actually coming out of PC um, by a relatively young geriatrician, Judith Gill. And the results of his study, and you've probably heard, there's been coverage actually on CBC quite recently, about the use of antipsychotic drugs in the elderly uh, and the fact that the use of virtually any kind of antipsychotic has a measurable increase uh, risk of uh, death associated with it. And the paper by uh, Sudeep, as the lead author, actually led the uh, Food and Drug Administration in the US to change their policy with respect to approving the use of these antipsychotics in an elderly population. Uh, the next item is, or the next um, <clears throat> piece of research is uh, an example from uh, the Division of Orthopedic Surgery at, um, at KGH, um, work involving John Rudin, who uh, is now uh, head of surgery, as Dale was earlier in his uh, career. The invention of uh, a, a template that really speeds up the alignment of all of the holes that have to be drilled in a bone before you can insert a prosthesis in, and whether it's a hip or a shoulder or uh, a knee. Um, a trial by uh, Ian Gilbron, uh, Ian is also at KGH in uh, Department of Anesthesiology, that took two commonly used uh, anti-pain medications <clears throat> and using basic molecular knowledge of how the pain cascade works. Each of these drugs targets a different step in that pain, pain cascade, and when you put them together, they actually work much more effectively than each uh, drug individually. And uh, this, this uh, trial was uh, extensively covered in the, uh, in the news probably, I don't know, about eight or nine months ago. Um, I'll be talking about the last item again a little later uh, on in the presentation, but um, this is a study carried out by Graham Smith, and I think those of you who were at the previous meeting heard Graham talk. He is absolutely committed to his field research. He's a gynecologist, I should say an obstetrician primarily, not a gynecologist. Um, his uh, area of specialization uh, involves complications that occur during pregnancy, most commonly preeclampsia or the development of high blood pressure. And um, the work that Graham has done has shown that um, about 5% of um, women who develop preeclampsia um, will go on to have an elevated risk of uh, stroke or heart attack. So he's now acting on that evidence, and I will show you later, has set up a clinic, which is really one of its kind in, uh, in Canada right now. So these are sort of more 
personal anecdotes, and I've got pictures of most, but not all of the people actually doing the, uh, the work. Um, so uh, this is research out of the Center for Applied Urological uh, Research, which is associated with uh, KGH. Involves a collaboration between a basic scientist, Charles Graham, and uh, a urologist, Rob Siemens, soon to become the head of uh, urology. The basic work that Charles Graham did indicated that, surprisingly for some reason, nitroglycerin, which many of you may have heard of, which is used to treat angina, actually um, restores the ability of the immune system to recognize cancer cells. So he got together with uh, Rob Siemens and uh, Jeremy Eaton, and um, they run a, a, a phase two clinical trial uh, with very positive results on men um, suffering from prostate cancer. So treatment with the nitroglycerin actually delays the return of the elevation in the PSA levels, for example. Um, that technology has also been <coughs> licensed and it's now being uh, commercialized. Uh, I don't know how many of you knew Jim Day. Uh, Jim died a year or so ago. Um, very active member of the uh, Kingston community. And um, he established the Allergy Research Unit at KGH. I'm not all about KGH, I just put all the KGH ones together. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dale's getting a little worried, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he established the uh, Environmental Exposure Unit at uh, KGH, um, which is a way of testing people for allergic responses to any kind of airborne allergen. So um, over the years, this was the first environmental exposure unit of its kind in North America. It happens to be in the old cafeteria at KGH. Um, but this method of testing has now become the gold standard for testing allergens. And uh, it, it's been adopted by, again, the Food and Drug Administration in the, in the US. And the person on the right is Dr. Ann Ellis, who actually trained with uh, Jim while she was here uh, at Queens, went away, uh, did postdoctoral research, came back to Queens. She is doing an absolutely phenomenal job of reinvigorating the uh, allergy research program at, uh, at the hospital, uh, testing some really, really interesting uh, cutting edge uh, anti-allergy approaches, vaccines rather than antihistamine nasal type uh, treats. So um, I mentioned Graham in the context of his work on uh, preeclampsia. Um, what he's done most recently is uh, establish a clinic that specializes in seeing um, women who experience a complication during pregnancy and or the perinatal period and um, assessing them for uh, cardiac risk factors and has then established a mechanism for ensuring that their general practitioner is aware of these issues and will follow and monitor the woman's progress appropriately. Um, and recently they've gone to, um, they've created a, a new website resource, the Mothers Program, um, which also is uh, targeted towards women who've experienced some type of uh, complication in pregnancy, not just preeclampsia. Last one for KGH, I think. Um, so, one of the areas of uh, strength, I, I think, uh, in Kingston, um, primarily but not exclusively at KGH, is research into critical care. And um, it's already well established, um, but you will be hearing some news, um, which I have to coyly say, I can't really tell you what it is, um, but it will be big news about uh, Kingston becoming a center for critical care at, at research across uh, Canada. So <clears throat> Dr. Darren Hyland, who's in the frame on the uh, left, uh, 
worked for, founded the Clinical Evaluation Research Unit at the uh, hospital. Darren is the lead investigator on two national critical care networks that have global uh, reach. Uh, one called CareNet, which specializes on critical care in the elderly, and the other one is called Nutra. He really likes acronyms, and <laughs> does come up with some fairly original ones. Uh, Nutra, as you might imagine, focuses on nutrition in a critical care uh, critical care setting. And all I'll say is stay tuned. Uh, sometime in the next couple of months, there'll be a big front page news, at least in the way standard. <laughs> So the Respiratory Investigation Unit um, is run by Dr. Dennis O'Donnell. Um, Dennis specializes in research on chronic pulmonary uh, diseases like COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary uh, disease, and uh, also emphysema. Um, he's really an internationally recognized investigator, a sought after uh, speaker. Um, and um, perhaps more to the point, he wrote the book on uh, evidence-based care for COPD and uh, emphysema uh, patients. Uh, Dr. Diane Lockheed, um, both KGH and Hotel View. Um, she also does research focused at developing the most robust evidence-based treatment protocol. In her case, primarily for asthma, but also for the management of uh, children who um, have cystic fibrosis. Uh, like I said, they have major, major lung complications. Um, she's the lead on uh, a national team grant, which is then funded by uh, a nationally supported uh, network of centers of excellence. And uh, the focus of her research, <coughs> supported by that grant, is uh, the burden of allergic and asthma related um, issues in the workplace. Um, so, PC and Hotel View. Um, this is another example of um, laboratory based, a uh, laboratory based researcher. Uh, in this case, a physiologist and an engineer, same guy, both a physiologist and an engineer, uh, working with his clinical colleagues. And this is really a first that was tested initially at PC um, and then at Hotel View. And it's a robot that actually will assess neurological damage. So if you have a stroke, Darren is a real Darren. Dale is a real physician, tell me if I'm wrong. If you have a stroke and you come in for assessment after, during your recovery, it's likely somebody is going to ask you to repeatedly touch your nose with your forefinger and, and do other things. And how well and how reliably you do that is used as an indication of how you're recovering. Um, this is a robot that does the same kind of thing but it does it absolutely reproducibly. It does it in a much more sophisticated way. And it's got applications in the assessment of concussion, of stroke, of neurological disorders. Um, even now for the assessment of um, chronic mental disorders or uh, disorders of aging, um, vascular dementia, early onset Alzheimer's and uh, <coughs> And uh, the inventor uh, is <coughs> Steve Scott, the guy with the blue shirt there. Uh, he gives an amazing talk. Um, and I would heartily recommend you think about uh, mm -hmm. in inviting him. He's a very uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic speaker. So this is Hotel View. Hotel View. Um, the uh, state lab or the research in motion lab. And um, I couldn't resist putting a defunct Blackberry up there. <laughs> <laughs> this, this really is research in motion, and it will be going on a long time after Blackberries have become extinct. So um, this is a state of 
the art lab, which as the name implies, monitors deep text in motion in a very, very sophisticated way. And um, that again allows a care plan to be developed to help the individual correct these defects. As somebody who's walking around with two replaced tips, I know that all the problems I learned or all the problems that developed in my gait before I had my hips replaced have virtually not changed at all. And it's just because you learn uh, how to walk badly. And what this allows you to do is show people why they're walking badly. And a lot of the uh, correction is self-correction. Um, but obviously, it also enables the rehabilitation therapy folks to design a more customized um, treatment protocol. So this is a really uh, interesting development. I think that um, the Department of Ophthalmology at Hotel Du has turned in a relatively short period of time into a really research intensive um, department. And um, I'm giving you two examples of the kind of research that's, that's going on there. Um, it's all focused to some extent on, it's all focused on the eye, obviously, um, but primarily on uh, glaucoma and uh, retinal disorders. So two young investigators, um, uh, Rob Campbell and uh, Delan Genapriya, um, are both working on ways of eliminating the pressure buildup that occurs in glaucoma. So Rob is taking an approach, it's a surgical intervention. So he's working together with mechanical engineers at, uh, at Queens to come up with a robotic-like device that will accurately, um, I guess, remove sutures from the uh, eye and assist in the normalization of, uh, of pressure. Whereas Dr. Genapriya is working on a drug-based uh, approach to doing the same thing. And I chose to, I think I'm ending on this one, um, highlight something which I, I, I think is one of the really more original and exciting activities that, that's going on uh, research-wise at Hotel Du. Um, the two individuals you see here are doctors at Sharma, um, Sanjay in one case and Susan uh, in the other. So they jointly started, um, started a, a website called Insider Medicine. It's now become the CNN for medical news. I mean, it has been phenomenally successful. And um, when I met with um, Sanjay recently, he was showing me an iPhone app made for China that would allow you to slip back and it, it allowed you to hook into insider medicine and slip back and forth between English and Chinese because most of insider medicine is video based. They generate anywhere from three to five new videos a day. And there's a repository of all of these videos uh, housed at the site. They're searchable and accessible. They have different gateways, doorways, portals, call them what you will, for students, for physicians, and for the uh, general public. And um, the reason this uh, header is here, seeing the light is not always good news, it is that um, Dr. Sharma was actually the lead investigator on a paper published in the Journal of, Journal of the American Medical Association, which is one of the highest ranked journals in uh, North America, showing that there was a very strong correlation between the rapid onset of light flashes or floaters in one eye, not both necessarily, but if, if, if they turn up in one eye, it's a very uh, negative indicator for the possibility of a retina becoming detached or a tear occurring in the, uh, in the retina. So this was an unusual uh, example of an investigator publishing a paper in a very highly ranked journal and then being the lead publicist, <laughs> which, and, and his lead was picked up by uh, news, agents, news agencies all over the world. Uh, so I've lost track of time. Um, it's a two or three minute. Um, I'll just, um, I thought it might be of interest to the audience to, uh, to know what we're doing at the hospital as in way of promoting the research and, and advances in clinical service that are occurring there. Uh, it's not something that we've done particularly well over a long period, but I think the 
changing quite uh, in quite a good way. So last year, um, KGH hosted a hospital research showcase. Um, it involved um, displays, demonstrations of research uh, carried out not only at all three hospitals, but also uh, elsewhere in the health sciences uh, faculty of Queen's. Um, it was an all-day event. Uh, there were something like 100 posters and 20 odd um, booths there. Um, and we also organized a day of, uh, of lectures. So we're going to repeat the event this year. Uh, the date is actually set for May 29th. Uh, part of the event, going back to something that Mark said earlier on, is actually tours around various facilities. Um, we can do them at all three hospitals. Last year we focused on 